Well, Happy New Year's, everyone. This is a combined video of both parts of the Danganronpa the animation episode. And uh, by the time you're watching this, both original parts should be unlisted, and I'll have them linked in the description. Get that? Good. Let's get into the episode now. Welcome to the parody where we tally up the victims in our favorite media. I'm Tessa Rose, and today we're taking a huge swing for the parody, because today we're covering Danganronpa the Animation, a 13 episode anime released in 2013. Judging by the title, we would all know right as we saw it that it was an adaptation of the 2010 video game. And to get this out of the way right off the bat, this was not easy to download, or, you know, actually find. I have three separate versions I'm using to cover this. First of all, a no-subtitled version that's in Japanese that's the first four episodes I have here. <laughs> Secondly, the English dub that fluctuates in quality that goes from episodes 5 to 10 as well as 13. Wait, you checked out her crunched in head? <laughs> and lastly, a version in Japanese that also has Spanish subtitles for some reason. No. As is the case, it would have obviously followed the main plot of the actual game. Of course, condensing 25 hours into 5.5 hours is really hard. But this is still going to be 5.5 hours I'm covering here, so it's not going to be easy. But in terms of its kills, will it match up with the original game? Let's find out and get to the kills. The anime begins with our black and white headmaster again. It's the same as it always goes, the guy is tied up to a rock and is launched up into space. As in common with the original game, he also turns into a bastard on the way back down. Gee, Monokuma, it's been three years and you still got a kick out of that? Fade into Hope's Peak Academy where our protagonist Makoto Nayagi is waiting outside. This is where all the country's ultimates are gonna show up and uh, be doing stuff. Makoto is the ultimate lucky student, which means he got chosen at random due to a lottery. He steps into the academy's gates but immediately gets a drop dead revelation. We then see a vault which has no relevance until a Tadokar! Two for that matter. He awakens inside an empty class where he can't get the steel off the wall. After reading this, he gets out of there. He enters the gym so he can meet the 14 other characters here. Quick, Makoto, quick time event, who's your first character gonna be? It's Ultimate Idiot Hero. Next, barging through his Ultimate Fanfic Creator, Hifumi. Next is Ultimate Finger Face Porn, Otaka. Then Ultimate Reason Why We're All Here, Junko. Stepping in from the back is Ultimate Plot Twister, Chihiro. This Ultimate Freddy Krueger stand is Celeste. Looking at those metal walls is Ultimate Vivzy Pop writing victim, Mondo. Next up is Ultimate Five Digit, Leon. After Leon, it's Ultimate Donut Swarmer, Hina. Harai's then pan us over to Ultimate Typoist, Sakura. But what about in the back? That's Ultimate Typoist number two, Toko. But then after that, her admiree, Ultimate Tumblr Sexy Man, Byakuya. Second to last is Ultimate Girl of My Dreams, Kyoko. Damn, it only took me three minutes to get gay. Then lastly, Ultimate Makoto's Crush, Sayaka. I mean, how could they not forget about each other? They were in, like, school for three years with each other. But, I mean, she also forgot, too. The students make interactions with each other until some sounds out of the loudspeaker interrupt them. Still doesn't deter Hero from holding that ball. In a shot basically ripped from the first game, the students get introduced to the school's headmaster, Monokuma. Why, hello there. I shall command you all to murder each other. Yeah, the game they're gonna be playing with each other is simple. It's gonna be a murder battle royale game, and the last person who will be standing inside the school alive will win. All 15 are quite chill about it. Even when Monokuma manhandles a fish. The least chill about these abundant close-ups is Mondo, who grabs Monokuma by his non-existent neck. Mondo should look closely for the bomb sensor? Yeah, that's because this Monokuma eventually turns into, well, just a bomb. Finally, their warriors are safe at last. Wait, there's 12 more episodes remaining. Monokuma is back. One of this academy's many rules is that you should not attack the headmaster whatsoever. He'll greet you with a personal execution if you do so. This episode's first 10 minutes is basically just the prologue of the actual game. That ends when Makoto stresses out over the anime's intro. It's a toned down version of the actual game's intro, which admittedly makes it less spoilery. Comes in with an extra title card! The students quickly find out that Sakura's most fiery punches can't even put a dent in the walls. And also after that intro, the students have been officially given their e-handbooks. While Leon and Mondo have been kicking around, Byaki has been saying, uh-uh. 
Monda's very pissed and wants to beat the shit out of Byakuya probably, but Makoto steps in. What that greets Makoto with is probably the funniest punch I've ever seen in my life. Makoto wakes up in his dorm room where Sayaka is waiting on the side of his bed. While he was asleep, they figure out the walls of her dorm rooms are soundproof, meaning that any murder that takes place inside of them won't be heard by anyone else. Who cares about the dynamics of this entire academy? Let's just see more of Sayaka's pop sensationalized past. But then also around the same time, they should probably get to the dining room, which is where everyone else is. After Danganronpa invents straight people, they head there. It's basically the only place inside the entire academy where the students can talk to each other about the discoveries they've made. First of all, their e-handbooks have a map. Secondly, Mondo's kicks can't break a all. You say that when we all know that Mondo can kill the ultimate generic white boy with a single punch. Thirdly, second floor entry is blocked. Fourthly, they have bouncy beds. In fifth, the place has a kitchen that Monokuma regularly invades. All of them have to do something with the place's overwhelming security, which may be too much for some people to control. Okay, Junga, I have a fantastic idea. What if we started to form a relationship? Fuck you. Honestly, my insert a line from Junko there may have a point because, come on, her red eyes keep on staring into the camera. Daytime begins at Hope's Peak where we see some of the place's many rooms. There's a room perfect for dance parties. <laughs> and a laundry room. At that day's breakfast, uh, meeting, there's, uh, some discussion going about. About how Monokuma has just invaded it. He's noted that no one's died yet, so therefore he's bringing out some murder motives. So why don't you all have an epic dance party and uh, watch these videos? Judging by Makoto's, we can all assume that they're each from their own families. Fun fact, on the left there is Makoto's sister, Kamo Nagi, who is the one of the protagonists of Ultra Despair Girls, that spin-off thing on Ropa game that gave us some peculiar lines, per se. Kamaru Nagi? More like Kamaru Nagi. <laughs> He's hopeful, but the video cuts out to uh, disturbing sights for him. The rest of them are equally as shocked. Except the Kyoku down there, who looks perfectly content with the contents on hers. And if you thought Makoto looked pretty bad, just check out Sayaka. She's actively worse. It must have affected her pretty heavily. One more disturbingly close close-up gets Sayaka running out of there. He manages to get a violently screamy grab of her. And yes, I'm talking about how she's screaming, not, you know, the action itself. There's even more violent screaming until she starts crying. Yeah, you guys, you all saw that happen, right? Also, what's up with Junko's face here? What? what? Sayaka needs some time to calm down, but she really can't when she's singing out of her previous pop sensationalist. Or no, I guess it's the intro that's outfitted with rap music. No, I'm not joking. The first half of his intro is, 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 a, is a rap song. I'm, I'm, I'm completely serious about that. Makoto makes his way back to his dorm and is immediately noticing the security camera. There's also a note on the door saying that there's a shower inside of that room by my roughest Google translation. One giant problem, dude, that door can't open! Monokuma gets close up on our faces again to tell him that, yeah, that's probably a design flaw or something else. Okay, dude, just wanted to tell you that. Bye-bye. Not even 20 seconds pass before he gets another person knocking at his door. This time it's Sayaka. Best I can tell about this part of the episode right now is that they're thinking about stuff. Like, you know, maybe about switching rooms. Bonus points, it's also not against the school's terms of service. There's only one condition to it that we all know. She'll probably never have to open the door. Apparently, they've been talking for so long that it's reached nighttime. He enters Sayaka's room and thankfully doesn't think about her scent. He only thinks about the last 10 minutes. The next day, Makoto reaches the dining hall where several of the students are already there. Then even more start piling in. The last few show up, which makes Makoto realize that something is a bit off about this. After Byakuya shows up, it's becoming pretty obvious. His ultimate partner in crime, Sayaka, has went missing. He goes back to quote-unquote his dorm room to find out that it's suspiciously been battered over the night. And most suspiciously, the door's been opened. It doesn't lead to the solid shit room, but something worse. Over the course of the night, Sayaka had been killed from a stab to the stomach and, well, some numbers. Makoto wakes up in front of everyone inside the gym because he had apparently passed out to side of Sayaka's body. Everyone else is in there for the exact same reason, Sayaka's murder. Because Sayaka was in Makoto's room, it should be obvious that everyone should be suspecting him at this point. But Monokuma's all like, nah, Silly Goose, it wasn't him. Because someone at this place has finally been murdered, it's time for Monokuma to discuss the next part of the killing game. The system of the class trial. 
It's a big annoyance in the games that I actually love, but you know, in this it simplified down to if you vote the murderer out correctly, they'll get executed. If you vote out the wrong person, everyone except the murderer gets executed. As promised, there's some obvious bewilderment and opposition. In this case, it's Junko's turn to try to oppose Monokuma. That boot to his nose was an obvious oopsie. That means Junko officially broke the rule that you should never enact violence against the headmaster. It causes Junko to become a rebar safe haven. Like, holy shit, that's actually a lot of them. Jesus Christ, dude. Up next is a 13 second long shot of Monokuma getting back up to his red uh, platform. The killing game has officially begun and now it's time to gather some clues in order to discover who the murderer is. In the case of her e-handbook, Sayaka's page can no longer be developed further. Makoto tries explaining his case to everyone in the room, but they don't listen to him. Some of them leave with him as their top suspect. Determined to prove his innocence, he goes back to the crime scene in his room. He finds some gold stains on her hand that suspiciously match the one on the golden sword. More sides include burnt shredded off bloody clothing and some crystal ball. Oh, and the very inconspicuous numbers. It also seems that both of her room plates have been switched as Kyoko finds out. Furthermore, inside of a trash can, Makoto finds a DVD. He loads it up and it's the same video of them doing this sort of thing. Oh shit, looks like Monokuma's close-ups got their asses. Makoto can't be disturbed any further as the first class trial has officially begun. He steps into the door and all of them looks pretty annoyed at him. More doors open and they lead to an elevator that they all have to go down in order to actually get to the full class trial room. This bends their descent or ascent into hope. Oh yeah, credit scene, it features Makoto sitting down in a classroom with more and more people showing up as they die. Next up is an out of order recap of the two kills featured in the previous episode. Monokuma greets him to the class room that he somehow got into. He has pictures put up with the previous victims that had already died before the class trial. That means that every space is technically occupied. Like the game, he has a mind revolver that has some mind bullets in order to sniff out the cap. We all know the victim was Sayaka, but the, the evidence of a struggle was actually there the entire time. Hina actually has something to add to the case. The previous day, Haru and Sakura were in the kitchen probably to start a Hope Speak cooking show until Sayaka walked in. Some suspicious milk looking let her grab a knife from the rack. Further involvement ensue. <laughs> Oh, and about that struggle evidence I was talking about? The killer would have obviously had to struggle to enter the bathroom door, which he thought was locked. Kyoko saves Makoto's life and my life by letting her be on screen that the girls' bathrooms only lock in their dorm rooms, not the boys. And the other thing, how'd the killer even get into Sayaka's room? Makoto has the answer. Remember when I said that she wouldn't, like, let anyone come into her room? Yeah, that's the thing. Her look of terror when she first offered the thing to Makoto must have been a ruse. The answer is in a note Kyoko snapped up. Look, it even tells someone to come into her room. That also dampers progression because if she never wanted anyone else to come into her room, why did she invite someone else into her room? And better yet, why'd she specifically ask Makoto to switch rooms? Seems kind of suspicious. The ultimate deduction they all come up with is that she was trying to lure someone into her, actually Makoto's room, in order to kill them. But whoever got lured in there had turned the tides and killed her instead. And so she had to swap rooms in order to pin the murder on Makoto. The anonymous person was lured into her room by Sayaka so she could murder them, but instead they grabbed the golden sword and had self-defense. The killer in question was able to lure her into the bathroom and stab her in the stomach. Before she actually died, she was able to write some numbers down. That's only after Leon screwed the case up. And what was her dying message? It wasn't just the numbers, but in fact, Leon rotated 180 degrees. That's already pretty damning evidence, but wait, there's more. Some precise baseball scales, which was shown in that other room. He used Hero's Crystal Ball and pitched that thing far to turn on the incinerator. Then he burned the clothes, but not all of them, since one remnant remained on the floor. And what that means is our ultimate first murderer and ultimate baseball player is Leon Kuwata. He, uh, seems pretty normal about it. That triggers her battle and shakes up close all to her eyes while Leon's just raging. When Leon doesn't want to, they have their murderer. Leon is the first blackened of the game. The fact that he couldn't get away with it puts him in utter disbelief. 
At this point, he knows fully what's coming for him. When the art style starts looking like the first scene of the game in the anime, we all know what's going to happen. Hey Leon, if you're such a good baseball player, why do you keep on getting all those strikes? Ultimately, the unbelievable barrage of balls gets him down. After the execution, everyone reacts accordingly. However, still with the class trial, that's not even the end of the episode. That's when Kyoko pops up within Makoto's room. In this scene, she just talks to him about Sayaka's well of true intentions. She actually wanted to save Makoto in the end in her own eyes. If Sayaka was so hell-bent on getting Makoto executed, then why did she write Leon's name? For some reason, Makoto still can't stop thinking about Sayaka's corpse. That's all while he's taking this out where we get to see his bare ass, good god! Oh, actually we have some good news about this time around. The second floor has been opened up to the school. Also there's a pool, wonder who will be excited about that. Oh, and there's a library where they can learn stuff. A main development is that they found a computer that won't turn on. Makoto has found a letter. What kind of letter? Well, it's an acceptance letter into the school. Meanwhile, Byakuya has found a back room that's filled with confidential government info. All of this is still, for some reason, important to Byakuya because he still thinks it's all some sort of game. That especially gets Chihiro upset. Monokuma comes back and is like, hey, you guys should stop arguing so I can tell you all these rules I have. Much to the remaining students is this may, they'll have to comply. Okay, so here's the one I have. Only boys can enter their locker room, and only girls can enter their locker room. If a boy tries to enter the girls' locker room, or vice versa, they're gonna get clonked with bullets. The next day, is gonna have a real true understanding of who he's around. Toko's bursting over him, what the he clearly doesn't want to have anything to do with it. Well, he told her to take a shower, so I guess he kind of cares about her. At least in her perspective, like, dude, what the, what's going on here? Makoto enters the dining hall where Mondo and Taka are waiting for him. They invite him over to the sauna where they have a bro down over their endurance in there. Doesn't know if that both these dudes are equally shredded. It had a profound effect on both of them because now they're best friends. Monokuma invites the students over to the gym for some more motives. Well, yeah, Sayaka, Junko, and Leon are dead, but that's still not enough. I need more victims under my belt. And to prove that, he gives out secrets of the remaining 12 students. They're all equally shocked as to what they find. Turns out Makoto was a 5th grade bedwetter. For some reason, he trusts that they'll kill people over these secrets, but come on, nothing like this could ever make someone kill someone else, right? More stuff is set up for later on, like Byakuya reading literal crime scene evidence. Chihiro programming some stuff. Wait, what's up with the toolkit under desk? What? Oh yeah, totally forgot to mention this, but Monokuma gave both genders some stuff to murder each other with. The boys got a toolkit, and the girls got a sewing kit. I know, Sakura and a protein coffee spill. All Makoto's worried about is his secret being revealed. Monokuma wakes each and every one of the students up and gives a damning clue to what's happened to one of their friends over the night. Some of the people are already in the dining hall, but Chihiro stays absent throughout. And Byakuya may have an answer. Byakuya leaves Makoto up to the, uh, this girl's locker room? Okay, even though there's a security camera and an entire minigun that could easily zap him away at any time. To both of them, it ends up being worthwhile. Someone programmed the ultimate programmer to die. Byakuya is unnaturally relatively calm when inspecting the crime scene and think he might have a clue on who did it. The investigation begins where you can already piece some stuff together. The victim was Chihiro and they died from a blow to the back of the head at around 2 a.m. Some things about it don't quite add up as Sakura's coffee spill is missing. Oh, and the poster. And also last night, Celeste saw Chihiro with a duffel bag. Byakuya leads Makoto into the library's archive where he might be able to piece together what's happened. He hands Makoto the literal crime file of the notorious serial killer in the franchise, Genocide Jack. Oh, oh, uh, oh, yeah, that, that looks, um, yeah, I don't know how he even got his hands on that, or to school for that matter. Byakuya thinks it was Genocide Jack because of how the body was positioned and the message written by the killer. Which, if you paid very close attention, will be behind me from now on. Hina has other worries. Toko. She's saying some stuff about how she won't let Genocide Jack have control. And yet already the class trial is about to begin. Now we're at the portion of episodes that are fully in English. Which is why the quality is now suddenly at 360p. If the students here remember correctly, the victim was Chihiro, and they got uh, a blow to the back of the head at around 2am due to one of her own students. With the weapon being confirmed as a dumbbell. How does everyone know this? Well, apparently someone checked out their bastion skull. Wait, you checked out her 
crunched in half? Due to how the victim was positioned, the killer should seem pretty obvious. Genocide Jack. All the victims are strung up by scissors and have the word bloodlust written behind them. Chihiro's body is in, uh, sort of the same way. All this mention of Genocide Jack gets Toko pretty nervous until she eventually faints. When she gets back up, she ultimately comes up as the one and only... Yes, that's my cue to tag in, ain't it, bitches? <laughs> Hello, the boss writer? No, that can't be right. The no, it's actually... high school level serial killer, Genocider Show! Wait, what? I could've sworn it was Genocide Jack. I have no idea why they changed the name for the anime in specific. And to my knowledge, they still call her Genocide Jack after this. But even with all of this evidence, it still wasn't her. First of all, let's mention the differences. Number one, Chihiro was killed to a blow to the head, not being stabbed with scissors. Number two, she was uh, hoisted up with an extension cord, which uh, Byakia had earlier. And number three, Genocide Jack claims to have only killed men. Terms will be edited if needed. With all the accusations thrown against him, Byakia still seems surprisingly calm. That's when Makoto comes to an ultimate realization. There's no gay people here, everyone's straight! So yes, the locker rooms had been switched, which would mean that Chihiro was killed in the boys' room. That means that we got another parody halter. So how did that chick get into our locker room in the first place? Quite simple, actually. <laughs> Our Fujisaki was a boy. Now this here is the first time in the anime that I've noticed something being seriously shortened from the game. In Trigger Happy Havoc, Kyoko leads everyone at the class trial to the scene of the crime. Sakura stands up and examines Chihiro's corpse for everyone. Sakura even has a reaction to it that is entirely distinct from everyone else's. And no joke, it's one of the biggest laughs for me in the game. It's a big ass plot point. Here, it's relegated to just like 15 seconds. There's very brief suspicion, Kyoko tells everyone, and then they all get a shocked reaction. Well then, if Kyoko was supposedly a boy this entire time, then it must have been a boy that killed them. Vimondo leads us to the second funny scene with him in it. You're saying whoever killed him has to have a matching blue jersey, huh? <laughs> well, looks like I'm off the hook at least. I grabbed me a black one. Should've kept your mouth shut! How would Mondo possibly know that Chihiro had a blue tracksuit? That one statement that came out of his mouth makes everyone suspect him, except Taka. So the story goes that Chihiro is stuffing a blue tracksuit into her bed when Celeste spotted them. Also, I love the art style they use in these comic strip closing arguments. I'll argue that it looks better in the games, but it also looks solid here too. They met up with who they were meeting up with, and, well, that's when it all occurred. Chihiro ultimately suffered a dumbbell. To prevent Chihiro's secret from spreading, the killer had to manually change the layout of both rooms. The killer in this case was Mondo, and for some reason they completely gloss over that Byakuya changed the rooms to make it look like a Genocide Jack case. And meanwhile, yes, that's right, Mondo Owada is the killer. The reason for his murder is that he thought Chihiro was strong. They had the confidence of letting out their secret that Mondo just seemingly didn't have. So then Monokuma steals the confidence Mondo could have had and just tells the secret for him. They were having an epic highway motorcycle race until tragedy struck. Mondo swerved into another lane and his brother Dai got him out of it, therefore killing himself in the process. And since Mondo swerved in that lane, it's technically his fault that he got his brother killed. It's very devastating for everyone involved, but Monokuma is bored dude, so let's just get on to the execution. Pro execution comes with the play of his preferred vehicle, the motorcycle. He is led directly into a cage that's just gonna have him spin around infinitely. And some weird wacky shit happens until it's all over. And then, get this, he turns himself into butter, funniest shit I've ever seen. It's appropriately equally as devastating as the last time- Wait, Kyoko, why are you like that again during this- <laughs> Oh, Taka's life has been ruined! A scene during the credits tells us all we need to know. Monokuma might have a spy with that as one of the students. Hina has some bedtime crying, so she heads out for a donut. She sees some green light emanating from the bathhouse, and what she finds startles her. Her scream makes the anime's rap song intro start. More rooms have opened up, which include a rec room. There's also an art room, a repository, and a physics lab with its own, uh, storage room. In the meanwhile, Taka is still traumatized from Mondo's execution. In record time, Monokuma invites the remaining 10 students into the gym for another motive. This time it isn't a little personal stuff, he just wants to give someone a prize. The motive is 10 million dollars, who does this guy think he is, evil Mr. Beast? Pretty sweet, right? Ah, ah, that's a whole lot of cash. <laughs> what the fuck? 
fuck is up with his shell, man? Monokuma then descends on his literal front of cash. Like with last time, no one would really want to murder someone for 10 million dollars, right? A trip to the bathhouse reminds us of Hina's adventure. The locker bay open contains the laptop they found in the library, which hadn't worked, but now it works. When the laptop is turned on, it's, oh my god, what the? That <laughs> is a dead person's face on a program. The program's name is Alter Ego and was made by Chihiro, which earned them the title of the ultimate programmer. Kyoko shoots a few questions and for Alter Ego to answer. Since they can apparently dig through the encrypted files of Hope's Peak, it gives the students a little bit of hope. A small problem is that they haven't exactly seen Chihiro in a bit. Uh, is anyone gonna tell them? Okay, Taka just wants to see Mondo again, and apparently Alter Ego also has the abilities to replicate what Mondo was like, as is demonstrated here and in the game. Stop fucking around! <laughs> he gives Taka a different pep talk, even though it still features his oversized hair. Peps Taka up so much he evolves. Ishimaru, are you okay? No doubt, bro! But who's Ishimaru? I'm Ishida! You sound like Muscle Man for a second. We have another bathhouse adventure as Hifumi is being caught of worshipping Alter Ego. Okay, dude. The shredded Taka steps out of the sauna and prepares to have a fight with Hifumi. Hero visits Makoto, but it's not for anything. It's just that Kyoko needs to see him. Oh, please. Just give me that note, dude. Somebody has stolen Alter Ego. Hifumi and Taka think it's one over the other, but Byakuya investigates further and deduces that that's not the case. Instead, he thinks that it's a spy among us. The next day, only four people show up to the mandatory breakfast meeting. Turns out it's a string of injuries that have happened all across the campus. Celeste had been whacked in the head with a uh, justice hammer. It's the first one. Turns out in Byakuya's living space, Hifumi had also been struck with a justice hammer, this time number two, and it was enough to cause a blood splatter. Turns out Celeste caught the culprit on this camera, and it's- Oh my god, what the fuck? Hifumi is sent to the nurse's office, and uh, everyone else just scatters themselves among the school. Celeste screams everyone upstairs, but Hifumi screams everyone downstairs, so they all split up. They find Hifumi, who is whacked in the head. It was with the third justice hammer. And look, turns out they also found a body. They send Makoto upstairs into the physics lab and the storage room it's attached to. That's where he finds Taka dead with a bludgeon to the head. It looks like it was from Justice Hammer number 4. Also, holy shit, back downstairs looks like Hifumi's body has somehow disappeared. Even Taka's too, when they go back upstairs. Toko had passed out due to her hemophobia, but now she awakens as Genocide Jack back on the tracks. They look everywhere to see where the bodies could have possibly gone. Oh, uh, shit, looks like the repository. Hafimi still somehow has enough life in him to tell everyone who killed him. Yes. Did Hero also make them play New World Order over this? Because it doesn't fit really well with the scene. Anyways, Tsufumi's dead now. Uh, like, for real. Yeah, so uh, I'm just gonna tell you right now that they rush through the investigation in the class trial. It's only like 30 seconds after the investigation actually starts that they find Hero stuffed into a locker and a Robo Justice costume. While they try getting him out of it, he remembers the events of the previous night. Clothed and bludgeoned. Well, uh, great news, dude. You're the top suspect since you never had an alibi. He may have actually had one, though, because there was a note found that basically matched what he said. Wait, what the fuck? Class trial already? Yeah, they rushed through that investigation. Tried to warn you. They'll think it's Hero because there were some blueprints found in this room that match the exact design. No, that's incorrect! It can't really be Hero since the handwriting on the blueprint and the message Makoto has doesn't match up. After Celeste shows the Pixar again and a few more debates are thrown around, Hero is ultimately cleared. What doesn't help in the case is that apparently Hifumi had faked his death in the nurse's office. With this, they can deduce that Hifumi killed Taka and that Taka's death was first. Hifumi must have gotten a little bit too happy after his job was done because then he was next. Also, he must not have been talking about Hero when he said the killer's last name was Yasuhiro. And the photo is even fake, so it must have been Celeste, right? Oh, oh, those crazy eyes aren't really helping. She tries to say that a real name all this time has been Celestia Ludenberg, but that is just probably just a plain lie. Since Hifumi referred to everyone as their last name, which is what everyone does in this anime, that means Celeste's last name is Yasuhiro. 
Her real name was Tayoko Yasuhiro, which means that she was in fact the person who killed Hifumi. She is voted in as the Black End. The first murder happened because she told Hifumi that Taka had stolen an alter ego for himself. Is that deal gonna cover, uh, whatever is going on in his room? She viewed this game, apparently, as a twisted mansion battle is gonna buy a mansion and have a whole bunch of manservants. <laughs> Should invite all those fantasy manservants to your execution, dude. Being burnt to death is all you wanted, right? Abba here comes in a fire truck to extinguish you, motherfucker! And runs her down violently after whooing into the screen. After the execution, Kyoko tells Makoto about a hidden room in one of the bathrooms. Turns out she was right, there actually is! He has all sorts of stuff of hopes peak before the students came here, and oh shit, dude, look behind you! He was knocked out pretty hard due to the impact of that thing hitting his head, but that's not all that we have this episode. Looks like Sakura's got something to do with Monokuma. Turns out she was the spy that Byakuya was talking about in episode 6. Anyways, the execution of Celeste leads to the fourth floor of the school being opened. It has a principal's office, a faculty lounge that we can see Kyoka hanging out inside of, a chemistry lab, Walter White's favorite place, and a music room featuring a giant-ass piano. At the breakfast meeting, they really wanted to know what was behind the locked principal doors, and here suggests that Sakura punched him down. Malakuma really does not like that, so he just adds a new rule right then and there. In the bathhouse, Alter Ego has finally hacked into those encrypted files. They've discovered that this killing game is the result of an event that happened the previous year which caused Hope's Peak Academy to shut down. And also, the architect of the plan isn't actually Monokuma, it was the former principal of the school. And although the task might be impossible, Kyoko wants to find out who the principal is no matter what! Also, uh, here's this picture of Fifimi, Celeste, and Sayaka hanging out inside a classroom with windows. Monokuma invites all the students over to the gym to tell them that there is actually a spy among them. Turns out my predilection from about a minute ago is right, it actually was Sakura. Although the scene in the game might actually be longer, what follows is actually a good scene for the show. I don't know how this scene goes along with the rest of the people who watched it or have played it through the actual game in full, but I, I think it's really good and solid. Turns out some unknown hostages have something to do with all that's going on. Although Sakura was Monokuma's lackey, she wishes actually no harm on anyone. Even if Monokuma did assign her the task of killing someone if anyone didn't die. She wishes Hina the best in the end, even if Byakuya isn't uh, satisfied. Turns out Hina would have still seen Sakura as a friend, even after she revealed that. Byakuya hates it when people are her parent lovers. For some reason, Byakuya still thinks that Sakura had some ill intent. Alright, Hina, uh, please punch this guy in the face right- OH SHIT, SHE ACTUALLY DID IT, WOW! Okay! <laughs> Man, I love this woman. So, uh, Hina, you have any names you wanna call this guy? Bastard! How dare you! Shut your mouth! Or I'll kill you myself! Holy shit, please do! Also, the way he said bastard was good, but, uh, it could've been better. Also, uh, we can just end the scene right there. There's no way for it to get better. Next day over in the dining hall, absolute terror. Oh, shit. Looks like Genocide Jack had apparently sliced Hina's arm. Oh, my gosh. She almost actually started murder for real. In the end, she's able to get patched up, so it's all kind of okay. Then Sakura goes buck fucking nuts. Then she calms down and walks out of the room. Makoto and Kyoko have another conversation with Alter Ego in the bathhouse. Turns out Alter Ego wants to be put on the school's internet so they can help them escape. Even though there's a risk of Monokuma discovering them, they go along with the plan. The next day, Makoto's thinking is interrupted by Kyoko walking in. Sakura's been discovered sitting down it's inside no the rec good. room and the door just won't budge and she won't Open answer. Makoto uses his actual elbow to break the glass on the door, move the chair, and open the door and also unlock it. When Makoto touches her shoulder, it's confirmed. Sakura has been confirmed dead due to a number of reasons. Very quickly, Kyoko deduces that there are head wounds, that she must have vomited up blood, and some yellow powder on her shoes. The other three come in and apparently don't buy that this actual dead person is just dead. And I'd be extremely pissed off too. Monokuma, inappropriate timing. After a repeat of the even more rushed investigation, it's trial time. When we get there, it's time to deduce how she really died all along. Even though she did receive a few blows to the back of the head, it's not what actually killed her. She had actually gotten poisoned. The blows to the back of her head actually came from both Hiro and Toko. 
And for some reason, Byakuya has had the poison that killed her all along. How did he acquire it? I don't know. To prove it's actually the poison, he just straight up downs that bottle in front of everyone. Kyoko isn't buying it and finds out that it's actually just supplements. The uh, killer must have planted that poison in Sakura's supplement bottles so she would drink it. With the huge spill on the ground and all the footprints, it could have been her who walked through all that uh, poison on the ground. So must have been one of them in the room with sneakers on. Hina then steps up and says that it was her. To some, her confession may seem plausible, but to Makoto, it's doubtful. Her and Sakura are probably the two closest people at the school. She says she left the room after Sakura drank the poison, which is a, a lie for sure. Because if she actually did kill Sakura, then how would she have been able to do the door thing from the outside? Also, the glass from the door that Makoto broke should have been also on the bottle, not just underneath it. This means all the spilled powder slash poison on the floor wasn't from anyone else, it was actually from Sakura herself. She must have knocked it from the ground after getting another bottle of poison. That means no one's killed Sakura, it was in fact her herself in a suicide. That means she also locked the door herself and did the door thing, just so she could drink the poison in secret. Actually, it wasn't all that secret. Earlier she had told Hina that Byakuya, Toko, and Hiro would all visit her in the rec room. After we got a bit bottle happy with her, Hina found out. She told her to get her supplements from the other room. When she found the shattered bottle of poison, she knew what was going to happen. At this point, it was all too real and too late. Sakura had already killed herself. Wow, that's just devastating. She even had the lie told just so she could bring everyone else down with her, just because she just wanted to be dead in the end. Although it's difficult for her to resonate with, Sakura is voted as the black end. Everything gets realer when she reads a note apparently written by Sakura. But that's not it. Apparently it was forged by the headmaster himself. Are you kidding me? I think at this point he might have had a bit too much trigger happy havoc within him. She didn't even want to help the headmaster in the first place and only had to after her family's dojo was taken hostage. She had one of the murders to come to her end and she thought her own life was the price to pay. She did this for morale to help her friends overcome the school. And with that, the rest of the students elect to not kill anyone else. However, with the actual killer of Sakura herself dead, there's no way they can execute someone. Therefore, Monokuma has to bring in a very special guest. It's their ultimate helping friend, Alter Ego. Monokuma brings in a literal bulldozer to help with the execution. He uses it to mercilessly crush the computer and Alter Ego over and over again. And unlike the actual count for the actual game, I'm gonna count this. If they're real enough for Hifumi and Taka, then they're real enough for me. There's a more downplayed reaction to this execution. This episode still isn't over yet, though. Kyoko just has to wake up Makoto in the middle of the night. After a brief meeting with Monokuma, they head upstairs. And dude, Makoto, I don't even know what I would do if she just walked up to me and started talking like that. If she did, it'd probably have to be the words, right? Anyways, here we go. There's another student lurking in the shadows somewhere within this building. There's a super high school level despair named Mukuro Ikusaba. There's another one of us in the building? Uh, wait, what? So they decide to alter one of the most iconic moments from the first game. Like that? If this series was gonna decide to adapt the entirety of the first game, at least have her say that iconic line. Mukuro Ikusaba, the 16th student, lying hidden somewhere in this school. The one they call the ultimate despair. Watch out for her. At this point, the fifth and final floor has been opened up. They found a greenhouse room up there that has some chickens in it. And also the ultimate bloody classroom that's colored in natural, real red blood. Byakuya believes it was part of the tragedy, but Kyoko has to do her own investigations. For some reason, he still doesn't want her to go on her own investigation or relay what she found to the others later. Because of her inability to remember who she actually was, he demands her room key, which she gives him. Okay, after a situation like that, we get more first thing over Byakuya from Toko. Okay. It's about then that Monokuma invites the remaining six students over to the gym. There, he's beating the crap out of a dead fish, probably. Someone killed him a Fortnite and stole all of his good loot. Byakuya immediately suspects that was Kyoko who stole it because she's the only one that isn't with them right now. 
Well, oh, uh, wouldn't you know it, she's at Makoto's room later that day. She reveals to him it was her who stole Monokuma's precious treasure. It led to another room on campus, which was actually the principal's office, which she was able to find the heavy info on who could have been behind this. Finding the mastermind was one of Sakura's ways of blowing the headmaster away. She was somehow doing this in absolute secrecy and tells Makoto not to tell anyone else. He agrees to, and has Kyoko agree to her promise that if she does this, he'll have to distract Monokuma. Well, 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 generic white boy, you got yourself a deal! And then, wow, crappy CGI camera. It's part of Makoto's distraction from Monokuma, just so Kyoko can go investigate the principal's office safely. Even though he can kinda snuff out Makoto's real intentions, he lets him off easy, and Kyoko is never caught. That night, Makoto has a weird dream of Hope's Peak Academy before it was the murdery place it now is. There even looks to be an attacker in his room. Don't worry, Makoto, Kyoko saved you. He's woken up the next morning and finds that his knife went missing. In the gym, four of his students, minus Kyoko, are disassembling a broken Monokuma unit. Turns out Byakuya found it on the floor last night and decided to alert everyone. There even appears to be a bomb inside of it, and not just any bomb, the bomb that was in it when Mondo threw it in the first episode. If Monokuma really is gone, then they have the chance they have to sneak into the principal's office. For her plan, they send Toko over to the greenhouse. She quickly comes back as Genocide Jack and also alerts some of something that happened in the greenhouse. You know, just a classic knife to the chest. It had to have been recent because the blood still hasn't dried yet. And for the victim's identity, it could still be Kyoko. Genocide Jack tries to find out the hardware, but then the corpse just explodes. They then become firefighters to put out the fire on the burning corpse. After this, they also discern that the victim could probably be someone else. Like, uh, I don't know. Mukuro Ikusap. Byakuya finds a key next to the body and suspects that it could be for the only other room they haven't inspected yet. The data processing room, and what do you know, it works. They find a whole bunch of security cameras and even a locked Monokuma door. <gasps> Monodor! They even find a full-on TV in there and it could even lead to the outside world. Then Monokuma just has to ruin their hopes and spirits. You know, for a place named Hope's Peak, you sure are ruining all their hopes and dreams. Also, do what's with that camera? Oh, it's for the big reveal. Turns out he's been broadcasting this live on television. They don't even know how it's even legal or feasible, and I feel the same. With that surprisingly legal and heavily funded twist out of the way, he walks out of the room. After their credits, some boots walk in, and not just any boots, it's Kyoko. Whatever, I'm just glad you're alive. Silver the Hedgehog and his friends huddle around Kyoko just so they can get the real identity of this corpse. And you're not gonna believe who the identity of this person was. It's... Mukuro Ikusaba. Here we have a pretty big gap within the consistency of the episodes I'm using. It's the only other one besides the first four to be in Japanese, and it even has Spanish subtitles. Because of this, I'll have to roughly translate some of the dialogue in English so some English viewers can understand. However, I'll move the English translations away from the Spanish subtitles. Pretty quickly, they managed to find all the clues to this case. To get a little early recap on this, we get a neat little graphic showing us the events and the time they happen within the day. The garden room had a system to where the sprinklers were set to activate at 7.30 each morning. This means that Makoto would be innocent in this case. This can be deducted because he was part of the people who threw water at the body right after it exploded. But then Kyoko comes in with a countermeasure. It could have also been Makoto that killed the victim. Byakuya notes that this is terribly out of character for Kyoko, but that she also has a point since they did give the murder weapon to Makoto after all. That would match up with the knife that was found in the chest of the victim. But then Byakuya pins the crime on Kyoko for whatever reason. The bloodstained tape they found at the scene was in her room the entire time. However, she isn't actually the culprit in this case, because she wasn't at all. However, in a subsequent point, Makoto notices a very obvious contradiction. If they all decide to vote for Kyoko to be the black and they'll never be able to figure out the mystery of this academy. Remembering their promise, Makoto thinks that she has some plan she's devised up. The fact that the trial started up before they can even really discern who the victim actually was was pretty strange. In fact, them being stuck in this trial is also a pretty strange occurrence. Then Monokuma decides to start the class trial voting right then and there, even though it's only lasted less than 10 minutes at this point, probably. It ends up with Makoto as the blackened. 
That means our ultimate generic white boy is now up on the chopping block. He's been sent to be crushed by this infinitely smashing block and every student's least favorite thing to endure in school, detention. He gets more and more nervous about that thing crushing him, but he gets saved just in the nick of time. Alter Ego has come back to save Makoto from execution. Kyoko had lied in the class trial, and that's the only reason Makoto's here right now. He didn't want to call out the lie. <laughs> yeah, I know, I'm confused too. He wakes up in some sort of garbage room and remembers when he almost got executed two minutes ago. Down here, I can see equipment from all the previous executions we've had in the series and game so far. And then down comes the special guest, Kyoko. The reason she's down here is because she came to save him. Yeah, hydrate that generic white boy material, Makoto. She says that she abandoned him during the class trial to achieve her full ambitions, but he doesn't have anything against her. She also says that Mukuro Ikusaba was not the one who needed to die there. She was actually the one who came in there the night before to save him, so it really wasn't a dream. Monokuma's plan to your entire town was actually getting Kyoko executed. And also, since the murderer couldn't get Makoto, they had to use another corpse. Makoto then started talking about how unreasonable that class trial was in the first place, so then decided to execute him instead of Kyoko. That's when they finally decided to get out of the garbage heap. Unfortunately, the way up is blocked by a giant ladder that they are somehow able to climb. They finally get back up to the top, and that's when Kyoko tells him that she's finally figured out who she's been the entire time. The ultimate detective. So finally, she doesn't have to walk around with a bunch of freaking question marks. Her efficiency in detectiveness may have also been another reason why the mastermind wanted her to be executed. In addition, Kyoko took the liberty of choosing herself to attend the school. It also turns out that the original principal of Hoaxbeak Academy was her father. They finally make it out of there, and it's revealed that the trash room is connected to the execution dumping site room. They make it back into the gym and meet Monica Mori is angry that Makoto hadn't gotten executed. That's where they strike another deal. If they can solve the rest of the mysteries of Hope Speak Academy, them and the other four alive students can make it out of the school alive. Oh yeah, and also finding out what actually happened to Mukuro Ikusaba. With all of that out of the way, let's get this all rolling. He meets back up with the other four in the dining hall. He even tells them what their final class trial is gonna be, solving all the mysteries of the school and finding out what actually happened to Mukuro Ikusaba. And also that if they can get through the class trial successfully, they will be able to escape the school. For the next class trial, Monokuma has opened up the entirety of the school to all the students. Even though in part 1 I said this was on the Spanish sub to Japanese episodes, I found a version that was in English so I downloaded it for this, which means that episode 11 was our only time we had to deal with the Spanish subtitles. This is where Makoto and the audience get the first full view of the principal's office. Oh yeah, and on the computer in the room, it turns out that the password was Kyoko's name all along. It leads to a secret room in the room that has a little present in it. That is, if you consider Bastardom a present. Oh, wait a minute, how am I supposed to say that word again? Bastard! Ah, my mistake. First of all, I, I'm not gonna add this guy to the count since he's a skelly, and secondly, because we've already counted this guy. He was the rocket guy from the very beginning. However, I can say that we now know the identity of this guy. Turns out he's actually Kyoko's father, Jean Kirigiri. This can be confirmed through photographic evidence. Kyoko does find a flash drive and the contents on it shock them. It's Sayaka's acceptance video in the Hope's Peak Academy? Oh, and it's also Makoto, Byakuya, Junkos, etc, etc. Monokuma shuts that down for some reason. Makoto then starts talking about how big of a lead this could be, but Kyoko just needs some time to herself. Monokuma then trolls Byakuya while he's doing research about Mukuro Ikusa. Makoto then has the idea to look inside the locker rooms. In the first locker, Makoto finds a whole bunch of study stuff and a crystal ball, which means that this is in fact Hiro's locker. And in the second locker, just a single notebook. It has plans on how to turn Hope Speak Academy into some sort of bunker with the help of their father, which means that this is Kyoko's. But Kyoko's father abandoned her as a child, so how does that exactly add up? Oh, because all along there's been two despairs. For more, Makoto looks in the place at Biology Lab with Toko passed out. Oh, then she just turns into Genocide Jack. Then she starts acting all weird with the corpses and almost kills Makoto. Hey Makoto, look at this picture featuring each and every student, which also includes Mukuro Ikusaba, the 16th student. That's before Hope Speak Academy even turned into the killing game it is now. 
Turns out the other five alive students get the same exact picture, although slightly edited. And here we have it, the final class trial of the entire series. Just this anime though. The target this time isn't to find the murder, it's to find the mastermind behind the entire game. A clue might be from the pictures each and every student received, with one person's face mysteriously edited out. Or, you know, obstructed. Everyone else thinks they're fakes until Makoto gets a little thought in his head. What if they're all real, and this is supported by the fact that he found those lockers on the second floor. And in one of them has Kyoko's handwriting, which she doesn't remember writing at all. That would have to mean they've been struck with a case of group amnesia. The flash drive has further evidence to support so. They found one secret of the school, but they haven't actually been able to find out the secret of Mukulari Kasaba or who the actual mastermind of the entire thing is. However, Monokuma also gets some lies on his hands and says that there are 10 corpses in the biology lab, but apparently that's wrong. Only 9 of the lights were turned on, reflecting each of the 9 students out of the 15 total that have died so far. And yes, there are 9 dead students so far, that is if we're not counting Jean, Daya, or Alter Ego. Makoto has one suspect on who it actually is, the dead Junko and Ashima. That's further proving when Monokuma lies yet again and Makoto calls it out. See the fingernails on the burnt up hand there? Look, it looks exactly like Junko's. The mastermind also isn't Kyoko since she had her hand burnt up and she shows them all her hand by taking off her glove. That means that Mukulo Rikasaba is dead and that it isn't Kyoko, then it has to be Junko, even though she's also dead last I remember. Remember the bigger proportions on the videotape and, well, uh, the fact that her face is just cut out of all the pictures she's in? There we go, that's the mystery of Mukulo Rikasaba, right then and there. Well, looks like you caught my bluff, let me just call in my cloud friends. When the clouds stop blocking the frickin' camera, we get to see the mastermind behind the entire thing. All this time had been the longly presumed dead Junko and Ashima. Also known as the real ultimate despair. With her reveal as the mastermind, it's time we get to the 34 minute long series finale. She's uh, more insane than everyone else saw it. Behind the locked door in the data processing room, it's been her watching over everyone the entire time and also controlling Monokuma. And also, excuse me, she has way too many personas to count. To both of them, the choice seemed pretty clear. Junko would be the mastermind behind the entire thing, and Mukuro would remain as a student disguised as Junko. But you know, best opportunity to roast a dead person, I guess. Mukuro's death in episode 2 was more of like a betrayal than an actual, you know, death. Just the despair inducing look in her eyes, dude. Pretty crazy. And also, one more twist that we can end this series on turns out that their amnesia was caused due to the tragedy, baby. There's giant monokumas and monoheads all across the world. If this is really true, then that must mean that there must not be that much hope left. Well, except in a genocide Jack's mind, I don't think she would mind, you know, all the mayhem going on on the outside world, reportedly. Oh yeah, they want to further eliminate hope by revealing the fact that Byaku's family has in fact, you know, died. We, um, uh, didn't meet them, so, uh, what are you expecting me to do? Turns out, another bombshell is that they've been stuck in the school for the past two years. During that time, the tragedy must have happened and shaken the world up. During the tragedy, about 99% of everyone at Hope's Peak Academy died. We actually get to see the tragedy in the next anime for Danganronpa. Danganronpa 3, the end of Hope's Peak School, which uh, is far deadlier than this by, uh, let's just say a couple of hundred. This would technically make the six other students alive in this place right now, the last of their graduating class. These two despair sisters had somehow managed to take over the entire planet. However, the locked up windows weren't actually to follow the masterminds, it was the students and their own paranoia. They had presumably only let these 15 live just so they could get their rocks off by watching them die. Also, the way this all was allowed to air on national television was because they had pirated and hijacked the airwaves just so they could just let this broadcast on television and get their rocks off that way. Oh, by the way, I'm skipping over a lot of this because a lot of it is just Junko yapping about random stuff about, you know, the school and how much she loves despair and all that. 
Apparently the way she wants to vote to her, cause that uh, everyone should vote to spare, and if one person even manages to vote hope, well, all six of them are getting executed. To paint an even clearer picture, they're all gonna die as prisoners of Hope Speak Academy of Old Age. It's basically chapter 5 all over again, the point where Doomco wants Makoto to get executed. Apparently her yapping has gotten into the minds of the rest of the students. With Makoto wanting the rest of the students to get hopeful, it's time to vote for someone to get executed. With the rest of his friends remaining hopeless, he fires bullets of hope into her hearts. Then he just fires them into the rest of his friends one by one. Next up is Byakuya, back to his Tumblr days. And last and least, he fires a hope bullet straight into Kyoko. She does fire back at his hope with a positive little pep talk though, so that's sweet. That fills in Makoto's slot as the ultimate hope. In the final violent screaming match, they go at each other one by one, proclaiming that either hope or despair is better than the other. Ultimately, with the help of everyone else, including Toko slash Genocide Jack, who is started with Mokoto, they all win against Junko. In the show's most intense scene, a literal bullet of ultimate hope just fires straight into Junko, who is then proclaimed as the last blackened ever of the game at Hoops Peak Academy. Apparently, she's really into the idea of getting executed, much to everyone else's surprise. All along, it was the despair she ultimately wanted from the situation. With that, she is ready to press the button and let herself get executed for all the mayhem she's caused over the past five hours. But at least I can go out with style! <laughs> We're then led into a speedrun of all the executions that have happened over the course of the show slash game. And when I mean all the executions, I really mean all the executions, even the one with the rocket. What ultimately does her in is what should have actually killed Makoto back in episode 11. What comes out of it is their ultimate method of escape. With that, it's finally time to say goodbye to Hope Speak Academy. For the first time in a long time, the sky's the limit. Thank you, Kiri. With me leading the charge, huh? That's a good one. With their hope at an all-time high, he presses the button and they're ultimately let out of the academy. However, that's not all we have to do with this series just yet. The anime ultimately ends with a shot of Monokuma on the floor. He's still alive after Junko got pretty beaten up in the execution and lets us know that there's always room for more despair. I'm your damn principal! How many victims did we start the year off with with another hour-long episode? Let's find out and get to the numbers. There were 13 kills on Danganronpa the animation, the first time we've seen that number on the parody in the last three and a half years, which is pretty crazy. The victims included six men, five women, one who's up to interpretation, and one unknown AI whatever it was, giving us a four part pie chart, which is pretty crazy for something with only 13 victims. <laughs> With a season, or you know, in this case, series of 13 episodes, that meant each episode had an average of just a single kill, which is pretty easy. But with the series total combined runtime of about 327 minutes, that came out to a kill on average every 25.15 minutes. I'll be so-called cheating with my Amethyst Flamethrower, which I'll give to the real Junko and Ashima. It's basically the big climax of the entire thing, you just gotta love it, dude. I'll actually give Broken Pistol to Hifumi. The whole tear thing is just really silly in a wrong way, and it only serves to friend the wrong person for the murders. How did he even have enough life in him to actually say those words? And also, the music backing is strangely inappropriate for a situation like this. And that's it. Danganronpa the animation was originally aired in Japan throughout the latter half of the summer of 2013. The next anime, Danganronpa 3 The End of Hope Speak Academy, would be aired just three years later in 2016, and I'll be looking at sometime within this year. And yes, I was not lying when I said it does in fact have a lot of kills, so... Yeah, you have those to look forward to in that one. On Friday, you'll have your dead, and next Monday, you're gonna have the horrors of a regular camp, so you better watch out for those. But until then, I'm the ultimate parody artist, and this has been the parody.
Thanks a lot for watching this insanely long parody. And oh yeah, like I said at the beginning of the extended version you should be watching instead of this, I mean, you know, two parts. Happy New Year! What I'll try to do more of this year on the parody is just branch out what I'm covering more. Maybe I'll even cover some video games, more like shorter stuff, you know, it could just be a huge gamble what could be that week. Oh yeah, and speaking about the schedule, you should be getting a parody every single Monday, even if I can't really keep up with schedule sometimes. I'm just hoping 2024 is a better year for the channel and me emotionally because 2023 was sort of a mixed bag, you know? That latter half I was not really just excited for, but it did get better by the end of the year, so hey, that's good at least. Like I said in the intro of this parody, all the episodes I had to grab from vastly different sources, so that's why the consistency is off among them. But it, nonetheless, I still managed to try to do my best on this one, and I really hope I did this anime justice. I hope 2024 can be a strong year for both me and the parody, and if you're watching this as both its second part as the two-part video and as the full video, all I have to say to you right now is thanks for watching this insanely long, hour-long parody.